Welcome back to Passionate About Music Education, a channel dedicated to you, the music educator. I'm Rachel Hardman, and today we're going to talk about how to help our beginner and intermediate ensembles. Now, whether that's your school band, your choir, or your orchestral program. Many of us find ourselves in the positions where we just don't have enough time with our students. We don't have enough time to rehearse our pieces and enough time to prepare for those concerts. So we're always looking for ways to ensure that our students are supported and also get to, this, to the level we need them to be at for those deadlines. So how do we do that? What strategies can we bring into our programs to help our students excel at a quicker speed? In this video, I'm gonna share some of the tried and tested methods that I've used in my programs, regardless of whether it was band, choral, or um, ensemble orchestral programs. First of all, don't undervalue the use of sing, clap, play. I would always get my students, particularly the beginners, to clap through their music or to sing and clap through their music, to sing the letter names of the music before they start playing it, particularly on difficult passages. Because truthfully, if you're a beginner player and you're you know, trying to play your trumpet and you're worried about making the right sound, then you've got to go, is that an E or an F? Is that an F sharp? Um, or is that a minim? You're like five bars behind everybody else already at that point. So breaking down that process so that they read out loud the letters, they clap the rhythm or sing the rhythm, and then they go to play it. They've already started to break down that process of, of deciphering the information on the page. I don't just do this with my ensembles, I also do this in my you know, one-to-one -one music lessons and in my classroom general music teacher because there's so much information, particularly for our young students and maybe for those students who really only do music in your classroom, who don't go home and practice, don't have those extra lessons. So it's your job to help them decipher what they see. So if they can sing it, they can clap it, then they're more likely to be able to play it accurately. So this is a great tip for speeding up sections of music that's complicated for them to get to being able to play it quickly. And following on from that, students generally are much better at reading pitch than they are at reading rhythm. And that's because predominantly our method books teach the students focused on pitch. So when you learn the clarinet, you learn to play E followed by D followed by C. And most of the time, your teacher just goes, you're gonna hold that for four beats and then rest and four beats and then we get the crotchets and then we get minims. But we kind of, it's almost secondary, the rhythm. What I found with my ensembles is they were generally much better at reading pitch than they were at reading rhythm. I would create worksheets that were in four, four, three, four, six, eight, and I would bring in the rhythm patterns that they were starting to see in the music that we were performing. When we played this as a warm up exercise, generally at the beginning of the band rehearsal, or even halfway through, just to have a rest before they go into the next piece, I would generally get them to play concert B flat. Uh, if I'm doing band, and I would, you know, and they could harmonise, but the focus was just on really good rhythm reading and listening. And it was great for our advanced players because it just, you know, kind of gave them an easy play and just focus on the rhythm. But because they were good at reading it, they supported the younger players, the less experienced students, to follow and listen and to I'd understand that they were playing together at that point, the same rhythm, which is really important when they come to band music, that when they get to sections where they are playing together, that they really know what that sounds like so that they can actually really listen rather than being just focused on their part and not listening to the ensemble and, and how their part fits with the rest of the, you know, the orchestra or the band. I think it's really important that students listen to the piece that they are playing. Um, again, most of the music can be found online in some shape or form, whether that's another school group performing it or whether the play along score that you will see from like, you know, your JW Pepper and Howl Leonard, etc. I always found a good link and I forwarded that on to my students to encourage them to hear the piece of music in its whole entirety, but also for them to practice alongside. And I did this for all my uh, instrumental and vocal ensembles, because particularly for our vocal ensembles, it's very quite hard to practice your alto part on your own or to practice the, you know, the part one, the, um, by yourself. So having the full recording so that you could sing along was really helpful and it generally encouraged them to practice more. 
especially when we got to concerts and you sent that link out to them again to remind them to practice with all of the songs. If you have the luxury of being able to do this because you have instrumental teachers come into your school, then don't be afraid to share copies of the music you're working on, particularly for concerts or for exam students who are performing, you know, external exams like the GCSE and IB with that teacher so that they know what you're working on. Hopefully they'll, you know, put bowing marks in for the student or they'll, you know, maybe point out where there's some difficult valve positions or alternative fingering needed for the clarinet. It also encourages your instrumental teachers to be supportive of the program you're doing, what you're doing within the school and, and to build a better communication link between the two of you. Now it's, it's not always easy to do that if all your students have private lessons outside of school environment but certainly if they come into your school it's a great way of, of just making sure that they're part of that process. Of course we mustn't forget the importance of notation on our parts and again we must teach our students how to do that, the correct way of penciling in notation making sure that they don't write every single letter but they certainly put in any difficult valves, positions or um, that they need to put in or down bows or you know anything else that that will be helpful when they get to that point in the music. Choosing music can also be really important in, in the success of your group and although sometimes we really want to support our students, encourage them um, and we think going down the pop music route is the way, often those pieces are not notated in the way that students hear them um, because they've been simplified generally the rhythm patterns so it actually can be quite difficult to play those pieces or the rhythm hasn't been simplified and then it's quite complicated to read don't be afraid to include pop music and to include some of the music from the latest films but be aware that sometimes those parts don't really translate very well for our students and they actually don't enjoy them as much as we think they're going to if you're not really sure play them some examples before you go and spend 40 or 50 dollars on a set of music and say what do you think to these ones which then and get your students to vote to see whether they actually like them i picked one which i thought the students would really love <laughs> and they kind of grumbled straight away so um they were like we don't really want to play this and they actually prefer the proper wind band traditional music um much more than the song that i thought they would really love so again make sure that you kind of include them maybe in that process before you go out and buy the piece of music a fun activity you can do with your ensembles sort of halfway through the rehearsal process of learning your music or as you come up towards the concert is to encourage your students to get up and move out the chair and go and sit somewhere else it requires them to have independence of their own part to not be reliant on the very strong trumpet leader that you have in a section that always counts really well and everybody just follows them and it also gets them to go and listen to different sections so when you switch them around and let them choose where they go to sit but they're not allowed to sit next to anybody who plays the same instrument as them so you'll end up with the clarinet sat next to a trombone player for instance this is a really great tool, particularly for your sort of beginner intermediate bands, because a student not only has to really concentrate on their part, they don't want to play it wrong because they're sat next to somebody different who may or not be somebody who they're really close friends with. But it also encourages them to listen and realise that maybe at times the trombone plays the same part as the flute or actually they don't play ever together and they kind of echo and answer each other. It really does help the students understand how music has been constructed and what role they play within the overall sound. Also one of the advantage from doing this was students realised how it sounded different to be sat at the front of the band or the orchestra as opposed to the back so it gave them a chance to go oh it sounds really different here than what it sounds like where i sit normally it's a really fun activity you can bring in that the students really benefit from and my last tip is really to use your student leaders to use your more advanced students to help your younger students to go and sit and play part three clarinet to go and sit and play part three trumpet or to go and play trombone now your older students may find this a bit boring if you don't obviously keep them stretched and playing harder parts but if you have a, you're in a position where you have a beginner band and advanced band maybe they'll come in as student leaders 
you may be able to reward them in some shape or form with community hours or if they do not be the cash something where they get ownership maybe they're a student who wants to go on and study music so you could give them a chance to even conduct the band do the warm-ups tune your band really give them that responsibility and ownership it's really good for their musical growth to step out of just playing their part and to understand how an ensemble was rehearsed and all, all the sort of stuff that we do naturally which they don't yet know which you can help them because they may become future teachers future future ensemble leaders also really gives our younger students something to look up to and aspire to and to want to become and it always fascinates me when you hear students in lower year groups talk about older students and go oh, they're so amazing i really want to be like them i want to be a play like them or sing like them or perform like them they're my inspiration and and i just love that about music and and that sort of I, and when they get to that point that older student did that three years ago so it kind of just goes around in a cycle but it, it's so lovely if you can find a way of really encouraging your older students your more experienced players to support your program with your beginner students or get much more buy-in or create that lovely teamwork that we want in our program and we'll also create you know friendships well beyond school environment. Hope some of these ideas resonate with you on how to support your intermediate and beginner students and how to really push them on at a quicker speed, particularly as none of us ever get enough time with them. If you have any great strategies you'd love to share, we'd love to hear, share them with our community here and passionate about music education. And I look forward to seeing you again on the channel very soon.